I'm John. Holly. Howdy. Uh, marketing <laughs> that is Beth Flanagan, and you should ignore everything she says tonight because she's going to flick me off constantly and probably throw things at me because this is what she does in every talk that I give. Um, so uh, I also go by Warthog9 on the internet because nobody ever goes by their real name on the internet, or at least nobody who's been around for 20 some years on the internet. But um, yeah, I work for Intel. Tonight I'm not talking about anything Intel related. Do not attribute anything I talk about to Intel because they will probably get very mad at me. But um, yeah, I'm talking about uh, firmware and why hiding it behind the curtain and pretending no one uh, is look or no one will look is doomed to failure in the advent of IoT. So I got a couple of questions. Oh, I, I got questions already. Gosh, I haven't even gotten past the first slide. Okay, you had your hand raised first. Sorry. What's IoT? That's the next slide. <laughs> <laughs> wow, everybody's going to flick me off tonight. <laughs> this is, okay, so so far you guys are the best audience I've had in quite a while. Um, you had your hand up next. It's the same question. Darn it! Oh. <laughs> Happy. Okay. Hey, you guys really are going to be one of the best crowds I've <laughs> had in a while. I, I, I'm not answering any of your questions, Beth. It's just, you've already asked your one question for the night. You're done. So anyway, so, so what is IoT? The reality is it's a giant buzzword that is the new cloud that everybody wants to talk about. And it's really, really stupid, <laughs> to be perfectly honest. Um, because it, it, it means absolutely bupkis. It means nothing. All an, uh, you know, an IoT device is, is any computer technically connected to the internet. And computer is anything from a microcontroller all the way up through the space station. Not that the space station is really. What? But my refrigerator needs an IP address. If your refrigerator needs an IP address, I think you might be doing it wrong. <laughs> but um, no, and, and I mean, <laughs> to be honest, you know, if you didn't uh, go and see Beth, despite the fact she, that she's going to mock me all this evening, I'm going to give her a kudo. Um, gave a keynote at OSCON this year that pretty much said that the Internet of Things is trying to kill you. And if you look at this wonderful list of things that I just randomly decided were Internet of Things bound, let's see, light bulbs will kill you because, uh, yeah, they'll overheat and catch your house on fire. Watches, uh, yeah, they'll forget to wake you up in the morning or they'll fail to alert you to something, you'll hit, get run over by a bus. Refrigerators, and this goes out to Terry because she thought of the best answer for how a refrigerator will kill you, and that's that it will basically turn itself off at night and give you botulism. <laughs> Doors. That comes in jars. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Apparently, yeah. Uh, doors. Uh, let the attacker in. Stereos. It will turn you deaf. Uh, toilets. Not going to answer that one. You can figure it out for yourself. Uh, vending machines. You know, you know all those things where the vending machines just throw things at you. Yeah, that'll happen. Uh, cars. If you really want to understand how insecure cars, how many of you have heard of what the CAN bus is? <laughs> How many of you know exactly how secure that CAN bus is? For those of you who don't know what the CAN bus is, the CAN bus is the network uh, protocol inside your car, anything made after about 1995 anyway. And uh, it controls everything. This is a wonderfully hackable bus because they wanted to uh, um, make everything interoperable so there's no security whatsoever. And if you attach things like Bluetooth in your stereo to the CAN bus, it's actually possible to reprogram your entire car to the point where your brake pedals make the windshield wipers turn on. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. There's a video on yeah, there is a video on the internet of this. I'm not making this shit up. Uh, toasters, yeah, it'll burn your house down again. Coffee pots, again, burning your house down, and it will uh, make you decaf coffee. <laughs> which, I mean, I'm not sure which one of those is worse, but I'm pretty sure it's the decaf coffee. Uh, medical equipment, again, Pidge, uh, you know, she's had a lot of extensive experience with medical equipment recently. And um, how much of that could have killed you? Zero, because none of it had, oh, in me? Yeah, well, all of it. Okay, so <laughs> stuff in me, nothing, because none Yes, of but you were wired up to how many devices that probably could have killed you? Uh, she's counting too high, she's run out of fingers and toes. Three things <laughs> and, uh, multiple things I went into. Yeah, so, uh, and, and thermostats, oh, yep, turn your heat off in the middle of winter. 
which we're coming up on. Uh, yeah, cameras. Oh, they'll just turn themselves off when the attacker's attacking your house. Uh, I'm not entirely sure how the bike's going to kill you in an Internet of Things thing. You know, maybe it'll make your battery on your bike explode somehow because you've got an electric bike. I don't know, but oh, somebody's got an idea. It could give you directions to Ooh. a really dangerous route. That is true. It, it, it's like the GPS that navigates you to the south side of Chicago. Exactly. It routes you onto the freeway and then it turns your lights off for you. Oh, there you go. Routing onto the highway and turns your lights off. That would be, um, that will get you eventually. Uh, your keys, it, it'll lock you out of your house and you'll die of exposure or something. And the TVs, well, I think they're doing enough to kill you already, so not really any change there. But um, to be honest, if you're not scared yet, you should be. Because everything that I've set up, that, or the, all of those devices that I'm you know, ridiculously mocking, they're all going towards this internet of things mentality. They are hooking up to the internet. And one of the big things that is going on with these is people are driving these from a feature perspective and not from a oh god, maybe my refrigerator shouldn't be on the internet and have port 80 completely open to HTTP traffic because that's a really good, no, that's a horrible idea. I mean, it, it's... Order more eggs while I'm at work. Yes, it will order more eggs while you're at work and then it will let them go bad and kill you later on anyway. But uh, it's just... One of the big things, and you know, I, I'm talking a lot about firmware, but a lot of this just comes down to, to a, this is a product mentality. This is a, almost everything I'm saying works for any kind of software. It works for firmware. It, you know, worries about, you know, the exact same things all come down to from a hardware perspective. This is nothing new. This is nothing unique to IoT. Um, in fact, in a later slide I explain why. But it's... <sighs> This is something that every programmer, everybody who's making anything, whether it's a website or a product or anything, they need to start thinking about these things more seriously because we are living in such an interconnected world and everything is such a target now that you can't not think about these things and expect that the world will be a better place tomorrow. So, I mean, like I said, everything's getting connected to the internet. You know, how many of you have had you know, a virus on your computer? Okay, you're all lying. Because <laughs> if you don't think you've had a virus on your computer, you should probably just go home and reformat it right now. Seriously. Because, <laughs> you know, attackers are no longer worried about, you know, making themselves known. In fact, it's actually more to their advantage to stay quiet and stay in your system as long as is humanly possible and make it, make it seem like nothing is actually wrong. In fact, there are viruses now that will go and clean up problems on your computer to make it look like uh, your computer is running better so that you don't go looking for the viruses. I mean, <laughs> I mean, and think about this. I mean, and, and now you're saying you want your, your refrigerator hooked up to the internet. That's just because the hackers want more, more processing power yeah. for their stuff. They, they, they want more processing power for their stuff, so what's the easiest way? Oh, well, you've got Windows XP. Let me clean up this registry problem over here and clean that up. And now your system runs 200% faster, and I can take 100% of that, and you get 100% of it, and everybody wins. So are the hackers actually benevolent? <laughs> That's that, that's true, <laughs> but and to drive this fear home a little bit more, how many of you guys have actually heard of the Therac 25? Not a lot of you, which is actually a little surprising. The Therac 25 was a radiation device that was built um, back in the 80s, and it's it's fascinating because it was the first time a, a, an automated radiation dosing system had actually a full software stack running it. It was, uh, everything before that was all mechanically based. And there were these wonderfully gorgeous uh, mechanical interlocks to prevent anything bad from happening. Now, they tried really, really hard to replicate those uh, interlocks in software. They failed rather epically. And there were at least six incidents in which people were uh, given uh, dosages of radiation somewhere in the thousandfold over what is um, uh, safe or which is le a thousandfold over lethal radiation. These people all died. And this is stuff that, you know, if you're looking at this from the IoT perspective, 
IoT, a lot of the things that you know, people are making from the IoT perspective, these are just Lego bricks. People are taking what you're doing with these and they're going to go off and they're going to do something different with it. Half of, you know, if you look at the maker movement, half of what they're doing is they're taking stuff that you know, was purposed for one thing and they're turning it into another. You, know, you look at a lot of the, the things people are doing these days and they are pieces in a bigger cog work. You know, so what you may be working on may end up in some other you know, product, some other system that you're never expecting. And this is something you've got to start thinking about now. I mean, this is a pretty extreme example from a software perspective, but it's something that if you've never heard of, you need to go read up on this because this was serious shit. And it, it, you know, it, if you don't you know, uh, look at your past, you, will, you are doomed to repeat it. And this is something, that, to be honest, I'm surprised isn't taught in more computer science classes, and it's not. So, but I mean, how many of you know COBOL? I was here for you know, C and C++ and assembly, but COBOL programmers still exist. And not just exist, I can point at the University of Iowa, which is my alma mater. They still teach it to graduates at the college there because there are businesses in Iowa that can't get off of their old systems and have to keep the COBOL running. It's the only way their business will ever work. And it's actually cheaper for them to train up the next generation of COBOL programmers to keep running this stuff than to get off. You know, on top of that, you know, the banking sector, a lot of that still uses COBOL. I mean, it's starting to move away, but a lot of it still uses COBOL. And how many of you have actually seen a PDP-11? Again, not that many people in the room. PDP-11s are still critical to the nuclear infrastructure of this country, if not the world. And those machines are 37 years old. How many of you are using a computer in your daily life that you actually physically touch that's 37 years old? 20? 10? Five? Not, I mean, five years is not even that long ago. And you know, you, you, everything older than that you've already pitched. So think about a, a machine from 37 years ago that's still running and running critical infrastructure. Again, these are things you need to start thinking about. These are directions you need to uh, pay attention to. And how many of you have used an ATM in the last couple of weeks? How many of you want to guess that Windows XP was still running on that? <laughs> it's actually about right. It's about half the machines in the uh, country, uh, the ATM machines are still running Windows XP because they're running the extended support version. Because yeah, that's, running yeah, they, well, the banking sector actually has some really good mandates about how to upgrade their systems and the government kind of told them shit or get off the pot because we're going to turn off all your ATMs. And the banking sector actually listened. And they're slowly upgrading, but again, it's, there's a lot of ATM machines out there. But, um, yeah, you know, and this doesn't really say anything new that I haven't already said, but shit's, you know, you know, how many of you are actually making products here, not websites or anything like that? Pidge kind of is, I know. Paige works with me at Intel, so that's why I get to brag on her. So yeah, <laughs> she flicks me off again. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, the, these are the kinds of things, I mean, you're building building blocks, whether you, you realize it or not, you are, anything you do, even if it, you think it's a, an end user consumer device, you can't believe that that is the only thing that is getting, that it's getting used there for. And to be honest, pretending that any of these problems don't exist, that's who you are. There, these things are not going away. The Internet of Things is not going away. The security problems that we are facing right now, every day, not going away. Even if you're building a website, that problem's not going away. Especially. Oh yeah, if you're building a website. How many of you are actually programming anything in PHP and putting it on the Internet? Good, because I would have mocked you unmercifully. <laughs> there, are, there are still a lot of people that come and in, uh, interview with me and say that PHP is their, uh, their favorite language and then can't tell me the difference between equals, 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 and equals, equals, equals. And if that doesn't scare the shit out of you, I don't know what does. <laughs> um, if you want to know what those are later, ask me. Um, 
So yeah, so what are the big problems in IoT? Security is a problem because nobody's looking at it because everybody wants to get their feature done. Your longevity of support. I mean, there are PDP 11 still running. I, I can't point at you know, any other concrete example as trivial as that. Um, Security is still a problem. Interoperability. So I haven't really talked about this, but everybody's trying to get ahead in this market. And they're, like I said, they're all running to get to a feature set. And one of the problems is, is that they don't actually care about interoperating with anybody else. Mainly because they want to you know, convince you to have vendor lock-in of some sort. I mean, if you want an example of that, you can take a look at Sonos. Sonos doesn't really care about wanting to work with any other music system in your house. It is the music system. And to believe otherwise is heresy. Every Apple product, if you are not an Apple user and lover, you should stop using Apple, is more or less their opinion. And you know th these are great for those companies. I'm not saying that this is a, a bad methodology in and of itself, but when you're trying to look at the ramifications of everything else you're doing, this may not be your best choice. And um, yeah, has anybody mentioned that security might be a problem in the IoT space? Because it kind of is. But again, these aren't unique to IoT. Um, these are a pervasive problem across the entire technology industry. This is nothing new. I'm not saying anything new. Beth said this six months ago. People have been saying this for years. And I am just banging on the exact same drum. But uh, there are some things that we can do. You know, this is a horrible situation and we can change it. Step one, change your mindset in, on what you're building. Stop thinking that you're building a product. Stop build it, thinking that you're building a website. Start thinking that you're actually building a community. Because there's a very big difference between a product and a community. And in a product, you build something, you throw it over the wall, and it's dead to you then. The community, you build something, and then people go and use it. They'll change. You know How they use it will change. It will grow, or it will die. But it... it, it makes a very big difference in how you build something and how you build your interactions with your end users. And this is important. You know, and like I said, this doesn't really... Uh, trying to look at this from a centralized perspective as well as, you know, oh, I built a widget. You know, th your websites. Everybody's kind of concerned, you know, about trying to centralize everything. If you look at the cloud. God, I hate the cloud. Um, God, I really hate the cloud. But um, Do you hate the cloud more than you hate firmware? It's debatable whether I hate the cloud more than firmware. It's pretty close. Because, I, I mean, okay, how many people have actually built a device that has something that has real firmware in it? How many of you liked that firmware? Wow, I, I actually saw more hands than I was expecting. Firmware is insane. These are people who, you know, a lot of these people who are building firmware, and um, this goes back to what I said at the beginning of my talk. Um, they've been doing this for a very long time. And I've had to deal with a lot of these people very recently, which is very funny that, you know, Bart came and asked me to give this talk tonight. I said, I'm going to talk about firmware. At which point, my wonderful girlfriend, who works at the security department at Intel, went up to Bart and said, you don't want to let him talk about this. That's a really bad idea. He hates firmware with an unfettered passion. And I do. I said what? And you said, <laughs> all the more power to you. Yep. <laughs> yeah. These are people who, um, version control is called the CP command. <laughs> um, sometimes if you can actually get to version control, they still use the CP command. Um, these are people who, their idea of modern coding practices in a lot of cases, and uh, are still stuck in the 1980s. And I, I mean, don't get me wrong, some of these people are absolutely brilliant. But the way, it, it, they are a symptom of the greater problem of, this is how a lot of people think that software is, you know, should be built. And, this stuff scares the crap out of me. I mean, firmware is the thing that is the earliest booting chunk of code on any system. Whether you, you want to admit that firmware is software or not, that is a 
religious argument, to be honest. It is software. And if you are going to make any argument, or you're going to hear anybody make any argument that claims that, oh, well, firmware just has to work, and, oh, software doesn't, that is an absolute bullshit argument. You know, saying that firmware needs to be any more or less stable than the Linux kernel is absolute insanity. Yes, the Linux kernel may be pretty complicated, but considering how many lines of code are floating around out there in some uh, uh, firmware implementations, they're not that much smaller. I mean, case in point, did anybody uh, else other than me know that you can run Python on UEFI? <laughs> Does this not kind of frighten anybody, just the complexity at which you are now able to run an interpreted language in your firmware? What is UEFI? UEFI is the, uh, <gasps> God, Unified Extensible Firmware Interface. It's the BIOS of the Meyer modern PC era. So every, boot it's the boot, yeah, it's the boot firmware for every PC compatible computer that's been made since 19, or 2008, something like that, 2008 or so. Um, and a lot, and if you see a legacy BIOS, that's usually actually running over the top of UEFI these days. So in comparison to um, some other architectures, they don't have uh, as much firmware. Some of, you know, a lot of ARM boards have very little firmware, but they still have some firmware. And there's just, there's a lot of differences in that space. But a lot of the firmware developers that are out there are actually living in kind of the 1980s from a software perspective. And, you know, one of the things that... What's wrong with the 80s? There's nothing specifically wrong with the 80s. Well, okay. I lots of things, what are you referring to? Uh, it's just the... We have grown over the last 25, 30 years from a, a coding perspective, and we know how to actually code better than we did in the 80s. What's wrong with the code of the 80s? Could you give something more specific than just slandering? Okay. Um, in the 80s, distributed version control systems did not exist. In fact, most version control systems didn't exist in the 80s or were really, really horrible. I mean, RCS, I believe, was the state of the art in the 1980s, if I'm not mistaken, which is a predecessor to CVS, which is a predecessor to SVN, which is a predecessor to every modern version control system. So version, version control is one of the big things. That is one of the biggest things. Well, I mean, it, it would the prevalence of uh, overflows, complete lack of concern by most C coders for yep. the size of buffer sizes. Buffer sizes. Um, just even the tools that we're using um, have changed so dramatically in the last 20, 30 years that, you know, even if you're, you know, 10 years behind in what people are doing, from a coding perspective or a coding problems, or even just knowing, oh, there's this new tool that came out three months ago that solves 8,000 problems and will discover you know, this buffer overflow here in this code. And, I, and I'm not saying that there wasn't fantastic code published in the 80s. I mean, we wouldn't be here without people, with, without everyone standing on the, the previous generation's set of giants. But it would be nice if the firmware team actually caught up with the rest of us who are making modern software because they're making modern software with 10 to 20 year old technology or methodologies. So, um, you know, I've gotten slightly off track, so now I gotta figure out where I'm at. Um, <laughs> yes, so anyway, from a, a centralized um, perspective, if you're building a website or you're building a service, tell your users that if you go away, you go bankrupt, anything happens to you, you'll give the code back out. Because people may depend on your product. I mean, how many of you have used Evernote? Okay, not as many as I had hoped. <laughs> um, but there, there are a lot of these web services there that are available that people are stucking, sticking all their stuff into. I mean, Google. Take a look at how much data you have given to Google. What happens if Google was to go bankrupt tomorrow? How much of your life would just suddenly disappear? Fortunately, <laughs> Google is one of the few companies that has pretty good facilities for getting data. Back. That's true. It, it, Google and you know, and I'm ragging on Google just because they're big. But yes, Google does actually give you the opportunity to pull all your data back out, which is unusual in this space. And um, I, and I would encourage more people. You know, give your users the option to pull your data back out. If you go under, open source your uh, your software, get it back out there so that people can actually you know recover what they're doing or rebuild the service on their own. 
And if you're building hardware, not that I think many of you probably are right now, but consider open hardware. Just because you're open doesn't mean that you don't have a space to differentiate. You know, everybody thinks that it, you know, if you open things up and you give away all the keys to the castle, so to speak, that you, you know, somebody will come in and undercut you and you'll be dead. It's not actually the way most of the market seems to work, surprisingly. A lot of the market, if you're first and you're actually offering, you're being uh, upfront and honest with the community, they'll tend to just use you instead. So, something to consider. But, um, and there's probably going to be a, a few people out here who are going to say that uh, open source, why isn't, you know, isn't open source less secure? I mean, we've had Heartbleed, we've had a bunch of open SSL problems, we've had some bash problems, we've had, God, I can't even think of all the problems we've had in open source lately from a security perspective. Poodle, that was one. Um, but the, it, it turns out, ah, no, actually, kind of this whole open source thing's working from a security perspective. We're not very good at it overall because a lot of the things that keep having security vulnerabilities are infrastructure. And at the end of the day, if infrastructure works, nobody cares about it. But when it breaks, everybody cares about it real quick. And this is a, just a fundamental problem of how we tend to manage things. I mean, if you look at some of the, the bigger security incidents in the last five years, they've all been infrastructure problems. And mostly, they boil down to the people uh, who were supposedly uh, trying to, to maintain these things either were completely and utterly overworked or didn't have the time to uh, deal with some of the problems that they were dealing with. The OpenSSL stuff is a, a, a brilliant example of this, if for no other reason than it's an incredibly complex piece of software and it is used everywhere and they were maintaining backwards compatibility to eight bajillion architect architectures, and a lot of those didn't make sense anymore. And they just didn't have time to go back and clean this stuff up. The problems that uh, OpenSSL had with Heartbleed were inevitable, unfortunately. And now that the infrastructure broke, people are trying to throw money at the problem and try and fix it. And that's great and wonderful. I just hope that that actually keeps going and continues. But, uh, yeah, that pretty much sums up that. But there are some reassuring things out there. There are a couple of examples of some neat projects that have uh, come out of companies basically just failing and people effectively doing the right thing. Um, the Nebez tag um, was a ridiculously stupid little internet connected rabbit. Had some lights, it did some things, and people liked it. Used a centralized server. And then they promptly went out of business because I have no idea why. Probably you know, some mismanagement, some money problems, who knows. But they had the foresight as they were going under to open source uh, the server software. So boom, done. Everybody gets the software and people, the community who liked the product picked it up and started maintaining it themselves. And the rabbit is still used today. People are actually building new hardware for the rabbit. I don't know why, but they are. Um, so people actually know what the rabbit looked like and did. That was pretty much what the Nabbits did. Why people thought this was amazing and wonderful, I have no idea, but I'm glad that they did. Because if nothing else, it gave me a really good example tonight. Another example um, is a device, unfortunately, near and dear to my heart, uh, which is the squeeze box. Um, independent company eventually bought by Logitech because Logitech thought it was uh, cool and that they could make a bunch of money. And then they found out they couldn't because it was kind of a niche product. And they killed it about five years later. But the original company, the squeeze box company, had the foresight when they still had the product to open source the server software for the back end. And the devices themselves are based on Linux. Community has actually picked up the, uh, the back end and they're maintaining it for the most part at this point. The devices still work. Um, every so often, uh, there's even companies now, one's based out of Germany, that's making new firmware for old devices to get new functionality onto these devices. And the community has picked it up and they're running with it. Dan, you should probably say what the squeeze box is. Oh. <laughs> I see. So the squeeze box is a network connected um, audio player thing very similar to the Sonos. So for people who didn't know that. 
But um, what I'm really trying to get at here a lot is that we are really bad as programmers for the most part at looking beyond the fire that is in front of us and trying to push back and get uh, some better understanding and better uh, look at what the long-term ramifications of what we're doing. And I'm going to rag, you know, I've ragged on the, our firmware team a lot, well, both uh, mostly internally. But they're one of the, the, the craziest groups I've seen in a long time from how they're building software. And I, and I want to try and make people aware that you know, open hardware and open source software, particularly uh, in critical pieces, in, um, most importantly in infrastructure, pay attention to it. Think about what you're doing. And if you're not getting the support you need, go and push on your management. You know, tell them, look, th when this shit breaks, do you want to be the one who's got the you know, newspaper headline about, we didn't support it, and now heart bleeds happened. But uh, yeah, and you know, yes, open hardware and open source software kind of makes it easy for other people to copy you. To be honest, if people are copying you, you're succeeding in the market. That's nothing but a sign that you are winning. So take that as a compliment. Don't treat it as a, a barrier to doing these kinds of things. And build community, because once you've got a community, the community will help lift you. And even if you're not there, the community will keep going. And that's pretty much all I've got. Other than if people really want me to do a sock puppet theater thing, I will do it because somebody asked for it, Evie. But otherwise, I'll answer questions and blather on some more. Now you, want, you, want, you just want sock puppets of, you know, stop using CP, but CP is the future of <laughs> firm, or source control. But then you'll, change, then you'll squash all the changes we just made. Don't care. Uh, the, the Postgres meeting was actually had a presentation. <laughs> oh my god, really? And, and, it, and it, is, it was by far one of the most talked about and, and uh, uh, loved presentations of all time. <laughs> but I mean, it was set up as, as kind of like a Socratic dialogue. Uh, kind of yeah. Like, well, I'm not very good at those. <laughs> Questions, comments, concerns, confessions. Paige wants to troll me. No, 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 I actually, yeah. Uh-oh, liar. <laughs> so, okay. um, you mentioned community support. Yep. Um, you mentioned that I've talked about that before. Yep. One of the things that I think that folks maybe don't realize on why I really push that is that if you're a corporation and you're trying to put something out, yep. you have two concerns, time to market, time to market. Yep. Everything else is second. <laughs> If you're starting out immediately with the community, communities care about different things. Yep. They care about features. They care about security. They care about that. So instead of creating a product, you create a community that helps you create a product. Um, and you mentioned you, you mentioned Apple before, and this is kind of one of the things that Apple kind of did this in the reverse, where they created a product that they got a lot of buzz and created a community around that, where it's not necessarily a community that, that produces stuff, mm -hmm. but it's a consumer community. Um, and the second thing is, you talked about opening firmware. Yep. Um, does that include like binary blobs in firmware? So, like at what percentage? Okay. Does the binary blob the firmware? Pidge here is trolling me on my day job, basically. So my day job, I am the open hardware technical evangelist for uh, the Open Source Technology Center at Intel. God, that's a mouthful. Um, and uh, one of the things that I am specifically tasked with is the Minnow board, which is this wonderful little small board computer. And she's basically calling me out that the Minnow board itself does not have an entirely open firmware. It has a very open firmware, but it is not entirely open. And it has 611 binary blobs that is used to actually build the UEFI firmware. I am working to change that. But, you know, part of why I'm giving this talk is that I am trying to change the mindset of, at a very large company, and I am trying to instill that we need to think about this problem from a greater perspective than me just trying to fix one very specific instance. We've already pushed back on that firmware team, and they're fighting us. So, working on it. We will make it as open as we possibly can.
I know that there are binary, I, will, I cannot kill off all of the binary blobs. And that is not my decision. And it is just something that I am trying to get rid of as many as I can. Okay. So the games industry has sort of tackled this issue. Yep. Um, you know, you'll see a lot of games, uh, uh, Stevie games, uh, released as, as early access games where um, consumers can basically play the game in its early alpha stages, uh, beta stages, whatever. It's, it's playable. Mm -hmm. and give feedback and sort of contribute to um, the development of the product. So is that sort of what you're, you're getting at in terms of, or well, um, I mean. Yeah, I see where you're going. Uh, you're asking, you know, if we got people access to, you know, software or firmware or devices much earlier on, can they help? shape the way that that product is going to go in the future so that it's actually a better product. Well, yeah, you know, building a community. Yeah, well, yeah, and then, you know, yes. And then once you've gotten it to them, will that help build the community? Yes. Um, yes, and I'm going to say that with several asterisks in that I know that companies are not going to, you know, give out stuff as soon as is humanly possible so that people can start commenting on, you know, features and widgets and whatnot. But once you've announced something, yes, get it out there. Start getting people to start talking about it. Start getting devices or software to people so that they can you know, do exactly what you're saying, which is get an early access and start getting feedback. It's good for you. It's good for them. You know, if people are using it, they'll tell you what's wrong with it. And if you get to them early enough, you can fix all those problems really easily. If you get to them too late and you're already in market, you know, if you, if, if you're agile, you can, you know, you might be able to, you know, fix these problems before somebody else comes out on the market. But that's not necessarily true. And if you get people access to these things and get them involved early enough, they may not want to go to some other company because you're now working with the community. They see value in sticking with you instead of jumping ship to another company that's listening to what they're doing and making a new product. So, yeah. That's, some of it is that, and some of it's just a, you know, if you go away, what happens? I mean, the guys who programmed those PDP-11s originally um, that are running those nuclear sites, they're not still running those nuclear sites. You know, they're, they're happily retired or doing something else at this point. So, and that's a lot of knowledge base that's just either gone or you hope that it's actually really well-commented code and somebody else can come back in and pick it up. Now, do you necessarily want to open source your nuclear power plant software? Well, it might be a good idea. Somebody might go and look at it, but it's going to be really hard for me to run my own nuclear power plant to test my new code on. <laughs> so, <laughs> must the... You need, you need an emulator. <laughs> I need a nuclear power plant emulator. <laughs> That's an idea for a game right there, actually. <laughs> Can I, so yeah, so so whoever goes and makes that, I want credits in the game for being the uh, the one who suggested the nuclear power plant. I mean, come on, the goat simulator's out there. Why can't I get a nuclear power plant simulator? It's come on, a simulator. yeah, it's a physics simulator. <laughs> There's something realistic about the game. So one thing I it, I don't know if you intentionally glossed over. Mm -hmm. um, I'm one of the, the, the firmware lumpy lump morons here. That, uh, <laughs> okay, if you're actually a firmware developer, I'm not actually ragging on you specifically. I'm ragging on... <laughs> so. <laughs> when you talk about the of things and, and things being connected to mm -hmm. the network, there is a huge body of knowledge and skill that, that comes along with, with networking and network uh, intrusion. Yep. Threat detection and all of that. And um, what are your recommendations for for uh, attacking that part of the problem? Because you know there are, there are a handful of black hats out there that can yeah. s undermine thousands and thousands of of firmware and software. People. Yep. So, um, and you're right, and there are in some cases way more black hats going against the one or two people than we would ever like to know. And so, what suggestions do I have? Step one, get a security person involved very early on. 
because that will save you a hell of a lot of headaches later on. But find security people who actually know the black hats. You know, find the people who go to DEF CON every year and say, hey, you should come work for us. You know, tell us what we're actually doing wrong. You know, there are firms out there that will go and specifically attack your software and tell you what you did wrong. You know, follow good pro uh, programming practices. I mean, one of the, the, the easiest things to try and track down are buffer overflows these days. We've got some fantastic tools, but people, oh, there's a lot of people who aren't using them. The, just, you know, look for these tools. Find people who can help you in this space. Just ask questions. I mean, if you're not sure, you know, find a local security person and just say, hey, you know, we're building this. What website should we go build? Or uh, not build, but but read to to get some basic knowledge of what should we be paying attention to? What, yeah. I, I'd like to suggest a different way of looking at security mm -hmm. and uh, not being as afraid of black hats as being afraid of the owners of the firmware. In terms of the real power. Yes. Is, is held by those who own the firmware. Oh of the machines that I run, those are the people that have the most we should fear in. Oh, they I mean your get. cell phones or your e-readers yeah. or whatever else. I mean, I've got an old e-reader. It's stuck at Android 2.3. What the hell am I supposed to do with that? I mean, I'm... <laughs> yeah. I'd like to suggest that some of the age difference mm -hmm. in technology community mm -hmm. has something to do with the fact that the really scary movies, when I was a small child, included this idea of people walking around with self-loved, you know, loved, <laughs> precious uh, surveillance devices yep. that we all walk around with. And so it's a different world. We're, walking, yeah. we're, we're pretending that this isn't danger. So instead of thinking about security as a anti-bad guy, yeah. you know, shoot him on the street kind of uh, activity, let's think that when you're firmware and putting it in a blog mm -hmm. and distributing it, you're giving power to few over many. So yeah. if you want to have firmware that runs machines that the populace will be carrying in their brains and their hearts and their body parts and their cars and their households, then think about what does that firmware have in it? Do you know? Does anybody else know? And have you made it open enough to be checkable? Yeah. 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 No, it, 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 just being able to verify things, um, a, a, a prime example of this is we just had an election and um, when I was back at the University of Iowa, uh, one of the professors there was dealing with a lot of electronic voting things and the electronic voting manufacturers were scared shitless. Great, yeah, yeah uh, were scared shitless of giving their, uh, to open sourcing their firmware or at least letting anybody even go and see it. These are devices, I mean, how many people expect their computer to count wrong? One. I have a bridge in Brooklyn I need to sell you. Um, these are devices that, despite the fact that people are you know, literally just punching these things in, will come up with different answers depending on when you ask them. Like at the end, you'll say, well, how many people voted? Ten. Well, that's really fascinating. There's only five people in the district. Well, how many people, uh, you know, and then you ask again, well, how many people voted? Six. But, but you just said 10. No, no, it's 6. <laughs> but, but what do you mean? Oh, well, I called home. Well, what, what do you mean you called home? This is an election. Why do you have a, a modem hooked up to you? Because then the technicians can get in and fix me. <laughs> but, but the technicians aren't supposed to be able to get in and change the votes. Well, they did. But, I mean, it, it, it's... You know exactly what you're saying is that do you trust the people who just wrote that firmware and they don't want to show it to you? I don't think there's ever a voting machine I'm going to trust. Well, that that well that's probably true too, but that's a. Of course, of course, the one we have isn't much better. No. It's what we have, but it, the the electronic voting machine thing is just a really easy target to pick on because if you're, if you're interested in that particular thing google trust the vote um, there's a nice project yeah. going about four years into build a nice open hardware open source um, trustworthy voting infrastructure i can highly recommend yeah. Yeah. or look for anything that 
Professor Douglas Jones from the University of Iowa has had anything to do with. So, anyone else? Questions, comments, concerns, confessions? Are you just going to flick me off? <laughs> I, I, I didn't exactly have a question, but I, I was thinking of another talk I had to with someone who had a implanted uh, defibrillator. Oh, God, those and, scare me. And uh, <laughs> before she got it, she, she asked those, like, can I see the source code? And they're like, what? And then she, like, checked it as far as, like, what, what, what's the process for, for testing these? And it was basically a certification that the manufacturer certifies that it works. That no. the, like the, the, the administration responsible for approving the device yeah. never got a copy of the source code even. Yeah, actually, the, I, I can go one step further and scare you even more. The uh, A lot of the um, pacemakers now have Bluetooth in them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I wish to God I was joking. I am not joking. People, pe you know, you go into your doctor, and they can tune you up. They just put a thing up near your chest, and they can make it go yeah, faster. Yeah. They can make it go slower. Yeah, so someone could potentially get into <laughs> Across the world, interstellar. Somebody could kill somebody from the International Space Station. Check crossbow. There you go. <laughs> I, I do have a friend who was uh, observing brain surgery. Ooh, those are cool. Uh, and basically watched them have software problems while someone's skull was cut open. <laughs> God, I wish I could say that that's the first time I've heard it that. Turns the, it turns out the patient records were case sensitive, so they couldn't find the name of the patient until they typed it in in all caps. So... Oh yeah. god, that, that that's so going to give me nightmares yeah. now. And he's, he's standing there wishing that he could help them diagnose their computer problem, but he doesn't want to be like, let me show you how to do brain surgery. <laughs> <laughs> that has got to be one of the most horrible things in the world, being a techno technology person and having like your <coughs> the software that all of your notes for your yes. brain surgery go so down patient, on you. The patient's brain was exposed to the room for a couple hours while they diagnosed this. And he's just standing there kind of hanging out, going, oh god, oh god, oh god. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, that's officially my nightmare now. <laughs> Oh no, I love horror stories. Bring them. I had a blood transfusion and I was laying there watching the nurses try and figure out where to use some software. Oh god, isn't that horrible? <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, oh, we just got this and we haven't been trained on it yet, so we're trying to figure out how to actually use it. It's a machine that goes bing! <laughs> and I was laying there like, I, I was like, I understand what I do, but I have to oh, do it right now. Well, and, and, and to their credit, you know, there's a lot of people out there. We make really horrible UIs. Oh, my God. I, I, you know, I happily admit I'm a low-level ser uh, server and embedded person. My idea of a UI is the command line interface, and that makes me happy. But I recognize that I am a horrible and broken human being. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. There's a CLI tool for Papa John's. <laughs> is it really? <laughs> I'm not sure whether this is a good idea or a bad idea to tell me that. <laughs> the other problem I've run into is not only are the interfaces hard to use, but the documentation is horrible. Yes, and I will happily admit I am guilty of that as well. Well, uh, many years ago, while well, most of you were still in college, I went to a seminar on user interface mm -hmm. and documenting. And quite honestly, most of the world hasn't caught up to what I was taught at that seminar. Yeah, no, we're, we're bad at documentation. We're bad at even documenting the public APIs, let alone the, the stuff we all have access to internally. Okay. So. One thing that I think isn't done is you don't take this documentation to the people that are going to have to use it and find out if they can understand it. Yeah. No, it's... The documentation problem is not something 
I have heard of anybody actually solving well. And it is, it's, yeah. It's just as bad as everything else. And, and the open source community saying, oh, we'll just read the source, that's crap. Like I said, I know how to solve it, but yeah. it takes money. <laughs> yes, it does. It takes money, it takes time, and it takes a lot of people going, why are you spending all your time writing documentation? Because then people won't die because the transfusion machine is so hard to use. <laughs> 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 or the or the the brain surgery guy, you know, must type in all caps. Why wouldn't you just do a two upper and be done with? Oh my god! So, uh oh. I, I have a small question. Um, my wonderful you girlfriend. Whole, you talked a whole lot about uh, community <laughs> and security, like these were magically going to happen together. No. Nope. <laughs> you talked a little bit about what it means to build to build security in the community and what it takes to build a community. Oh god, that's a, like three more talks. <laughs> god, yeah, that really is like three more talks. So the, the simplest way to build a community is um, actually let people come in and uh, help you. I mean, put stuff out there and then say, look guys, this is what I'm doing. Is this interesting? And if they say no, well, then you failed. And if they say yes, well, they'll tell you what's wrong. You know, you know, why can't I do this? Why can't I do that? Well, okay, here's some new document, you know, from the documentation perspective. If somebody asks you a question and it's not on, in a piece of documentation, you should document it. That will help, people like that. In fact, it's apparently mostly working for me. Because um, now my, most of my community, the middle board community, is actually answering their questions on their own. It's very weird, wasn't expecting that. But um, the security problem, I don't have an answer to that one, to be perfectly honest. Other than you should get a security person involved as quickly as is humanly possible. And I don't know how you would attract those to your project. Money. Okay, money's a really good way to do that. But money will only solve so many problems and there are only so many security people that are worth their salt. There are a lot of bad security people out there. Just, just warning you. One thing yeah. I would add to that is that Portland in particular has yeah. a very, very good security community. Yes. A lot of open source, open hardware people in it. Yep. Um, those are good people to serve as an initial resource. If you're yep. looking for somebody, they're good people to talk yep. to to help you vet somebody. And yep. they're good people to help you do a you know, five minute review of your product and raise all those issues you never even knew you. Yeah, no, I, I was going to say, Kay's is going to hate me, but if you really want to go and at least start with somebody, you know, ping Kay's cook on the internet. Mm -hmm. Don't tell him I sent you. <laughs> Hopefully this isn't being recorded. Um, the, <laughs> the, the meeting that happens on Monday nights every other week, Dwarfbot PDX, um, yeah, a lot of the security people tend to be there, yeah. and I can recommend that as a place to find some of the, um, yeah. there's, you know, if you watch Calligator.org, which everybody here should know about, see a bunch of security related things, go to one of them, talk to people. Um, they really aren't that hard to find. And no. the ones in Portland, the community in Portland, the advantage you have is that rather than trusting any one person, you're trusting a group of people who yes. have a stellar reputation. That's yep. the way to do it. So, blue shirt and then black shirt. <laughs> Because I think Blue Shirt had his hand up first. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Whenever I walk into a coffee shop and I see, I recognize one of those security people, I always ask, is the network safe? Well, the answer is always no. <laughs> well, especially if you're in there, because you're well, yes. doing something. Um, but I, I actually uh, had another thing. Um, you said about like the viruses that make computers work better. Um, I read an article about the at least as far back as the 1990s, there uh -huh. was viruses in the wild that removed other viruses. Yep. So I was like, oh, I'm going to remove all the viruses that aren't me that I know about. Yep. And so it's only my virus that's on your computer now. Yep. So. So as an evangelist, what are some of the objections that you encounter and how have you argued that? In terms of... So the biggest argument I've had mostly with our firmware team is that they're, they're scared of open source, to be perfectly honest. They're not used to it. It's not their model. 
they're used to, I mean, particularly from a firmware perspective, from a PC uh, firmware, these things are huge. These things are absolutely massive. From a, you know, if you look at a, a, a PC firmware versus a, an ARM firmware, that it, it's, you know, one's, you know, a, a small anthill and one's Mount Hood. I mean, just in terms of size. There's millions of lines of code in the UEFI firmware. I mean, if you go out to, 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 I don't think I've got this documented on the Middleboard wiki. Or, or no, it's on the Middleboard wiki. But you can go download the Middleboard firmware right now. It's a UEFI implementation. It's from Intel. It's BSD licensed. And there's some binary blobs, possibly 611 of them. But you can go download this. You can stare at it. And I mean, just the, the build documentation. So how many of you know Bash? Out of curiosity, oh good, there's actually a number of people. It is um, the way they thought to build the build system for the Linux target, and since this is all open source, I can talk about it. It's wonderful. Um, so you you run the build program by sourcing it into your current shell. <laughs> I, I mean seriously, it's dot space dot slash build script. That. That's you have a build script? Yeah, we have a build I know. <laughs> hey. I've or, I I I've already told the firmware team I'm going to fix that problem because that offends my sensibilities. And if it's offending me, oh my god, I there's a reason I haven't said too much about that firmware release for the middle board because I'm scared to let the rest of the community know it's there because it'll laugh so hard. So it's there if you really want it. <laughs> if you want a really good chuckle and to see some of the, the programming practices I'm kind of kind of grumbling about and gritting my teeth, um, go look at that. A lot of it's just education and trying to get the, and just talking through things with them, um, which is a very long and very involved process, unfortunately. Because they're so used to their old models, and you know, if you've been doing these kinds of things, you know, let me see. One of the phrases they have specifically used is, you know, you've got to understand. Some people have built their entire careers on this kind of um, method. To which I keep wanting to say, well, and I've built my career on open source for nothing, then, because I've been doing this for. I've got a, no. <laughs> I've, I've got a good story. I've got a few more seconds. Well, I'll take his question, then I'll do your story. How's that? Yeah. So you were talking about um, procedures and processes. It sounded like you were advocating for static analysis tools for code. I wouldn't be able to tell you a good static analysis tool to save my life. I asked my wonderful girlfriend that question. <laughs> Which is one of the security people in the room. I know good static analysis. OK, so apparently the security person. Sparse isn't terrible. Sparse isn't um, bad. Sparse and it's, but it is there. That's true. The, the one that I'm using on the product I'm working on now is Coverity, which is free for open source. If you want to go, go to their website, you can see the reports for a bunch of open source projects, so that's yeah. interesting at least. So. Now, that was basically my question is, you know, I, I do know about Coverity, and it's like, okay, well, just how much, you know, for, I know they, I know they go to certain projects and just, yeah. For 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 yeah, if you're, proof of uh, I don't know yeah I don't know if it's just uh, you know uh, look at us yeah. is what our tool can do kind of thing there's a lot of companies that'll go and if you're an open source project they'll let you run their tool for free there there's a number out there I've had over the years a number of yeah I'm not going to talk about Big Keeper that's um. <laughs> Source tools. Sparse is probably yeah. the principal one, but there are several others. None of them are nearly as sophisticated as what Coverity does or claims to do, at least because yeah. we don't know what it actually does. Um, <laughs> so that whole closed none software them, thing. Um, you know, none of them are as mature um, or as well regarded as that. But they are out there, and you know, I think this is a place where you know, people in this room can help to some extent yeah. um, improve some of those tools. The yeah. foundations are all. Okay. Otherwise, I literally just passed the hour-long mark. Okay. So I should probably give you guys back the rest of your evening. So thank you. Thank you. I'll go away.